I'm going to demonstrate installing Ubuntu Linux inside VirtualBox. This assumes you've got VirtualBox already installed. I've got VirtualBox open here. We can see the VirtualBox manager. What I'll do is I'll download the Linux image and load it in VirtualBox and go through the Ubuntu installation procedure. Uh, the Linux image to get, there are different mirrors available to uh, download. The one I'm going to use is the Rnet mirror, which is uh, probably the fastest within the Australian University network. I'll go to Ubuntu and we look for releases. And in this case, I'm looking for a specific version, 16.04.3. And we're going to install the server version, not the desktop. So it's going to be command line only. So I scroll down looking for server version and there's AMD 64 and i386, 64-bit operating systems are referred to as AMD 64, so that's what we want. Ubuntu 16.04.3 server edition AMD 64, we want the ISO image, like it's a CD image, 825 megabytes. We save that and it's downloading, it's taking a, a few minutes. Uh, I've already got this downloaded so we can bypass those few minutes and immediately load it up. So what we need to do in VirtualBox is create uh, a new machine and give it a name. I'm going to just call it Linux Demo but you should give it a more meaningful name maybe about the Ubuntu uh, server version and in fact if we include Ubuntu in the name you see that uh, VirtualBox detects uh, the, the most common version Ubuntu 64-bit type Linux and next we need to choose the amount of memory we're going to allocate that uh, Ubuntu Linux machine it's defaulting to 1024 megabytes a gigabyte my computer has 8 gigabytes. This would be fine, but I'm actually going to drop it down to 512. I could possibly try 256 megabytes. Since we're just running a cut down server with no GUI, you'd probably get by with 256. But with 512, uh, it should be fine. The problem with having larger is that uh, if I want to run multiple machines at the same time, then I start to use up some of my 8 gigabytes of memory and things may slow down. So 512 is a good compromise. We need a disk for this virtual machine, so let's create a hard disk now and use a default virtual box disk image. And you can choose either dynamically or fixed size. Fixed size is generally faster to operate, but takes some, some time and space up, uh, up front. Because I'm going to, going to use a small disk, we'll use fixed size. And I'll just keep the same name. I won't use the default location. I'm going to set it to, let's say, uh, two and a half gig. Okay. We could probably get down to 2 gig, not a problem. Uh, two and a half, we'll see later, we'll, we'll have a, some swap space automatically created, which will use up some of that. So that creates a disk image file in VirtualBox. It takes a few seconds, uh, that 2.5 gigabyte file. And then we uh, are set up. We have a new machine created. Uh, we haven't done anything with it yet. You know it's powered off. So we'll have a look at the settings before we do anything with it and boot a machine. If we right click on the uh, virtual machine and choose settings, we can see some of the things we can change for this uh, virtual machine. Most of the settings were in change, so we'll quickly go through some of them. Uh, the uh, name, the type we set before, the folders and description are not needed. If we go to system, there's a few things of importance there. Uh, it refers to the amount of memory, so we can change that later. We've got uh, half a gig RAM. We could increase that later. Uh, the boot order, some details about the chipset used or, or emulated by VirtualBox. The processor, we have a single processor uh, allocated to this virtual machine. 
When you have a, a, a quad-core CPU, you essentially have four uh, processors in your computer. And what you could do is you could allocate multiple of those to a particular virtual machine. In this case, because the server edition of Ubuntu is, is quite low on resource consumption, we don't need anything special here. Acceleration uh, allows the, the uh, or VirtualBox to use some of the features of the, the chipset and the, the instruction set inside the Intel or AMD CPU in your host computer. And if you can enable the VTX or AMD V, then generally that will give you better performance. They're not necessary, but hardware, hardware virtualization will generally give much better performance than software virtualization. Enable them if you can. If you're using your own computer, you may have to change some BIOS settings to turn them on. We're going to use a command line uh, operating system, so the video display is not, a, not of interest to us. It's allocated 16 megabytes, so we could change it. it, it won't make any difference. The storage, it's re referring to our hard disk we've created. Uh, we can add new disks. For example, we want to boot from the CD when we first start up. So we could do that later, but we could actually do it now. We can choose a disk to boot from. So I'll choose the virtual optical disk file and try and find my downloaded ISO image. Here it is. So the, the, file, the 840 megabyte file we downloaded before that will act as the disk inside our CD drive. So when the machine boots first, it will boot from the disk. Most of the other settings we don't need to change. Audio, we don't care about with command line. Serial ports, no. USB, the default ones. Shared folders, user interface. The one thing we should look at is the network settings. Firstly, note that VirtualBox allows you to emulate your guest machine having multiple network adapters. Uh, for example, imagine you've got uh, two LAN cards in a PC or in a server. We can enable two adapters. By default, adapter one is enabled, the other adapters are disabled. VirtualBox allows you to connect from your guest machine to the host machine and out to the internet in different ways. By default, it's network address translation but we're going to change that. And the manual for VirtualBox has a good description. So here's the help page or the, uh, on virtual networking. There's a good explanation of the different modes that are available, so it's worth reading through. Uh, this table gives an overview. We're currently using NAT as the default option. That allows quite easily my virtual machine to communicate out to the internet, say for web browsing or sending emails. It's a little bit more complicated if I want to allow someone on the internet to connect into a server on my virtual machine in this fourth column. I need to set up port forwarding to get that to work. It's possible, but we need to do some additional setup. If I have two virtual machines inside VirtualBox, they can't talk to each other. And there's no direct communications between the virtual machine and the host. In some cases, we'd like to have multiple virtual machines talk to each other and make it easier to communicate between the virtual machine and the host, as well as allow computers on the internet to access our virtual machine. So we're going to use bridge mode. Another option is internal mode, which is a little bit more secure or safer than bridge mode. So you may consider that. Uh, but again, it requires a little bit of extra setup for port forwarding. So we'll go for the simple bridge mode in this case. We'll set that and bridge adapter and the name. These are adapters available from your host computer. Note there's a wireless adapter in my uh, laptop and the Broadcom, Broadcom Gigabit Ethernet adapter, which I'm currently using for uh, network access. Choose the one that you're going to use for internet access and be careful there if uh, you uh, plug in a LAN cable and previously you've chosen wireless, then you may lose network connectivity inside your guest machine. The other default settings should be sufficient. 
So we've choose to bridge, chosen a bridged adapter. And now let's boot our machine. So my machine is currently powered off. I start the machine and that's going to boot up my virtual machine. Remember it's going to load up the CD which was in the which we specified which contains the uh, downloaded ISO image that we used. We'll choose our installation language, English. And before we go to installing the Ubuntu server, there is one thing that we need to change. Note down the bottom there are some options. We can choose a mode, in particular F4 allows us to choose to install not the server as if on real hardware, but install a minimal virtual machine which only installs software which is needed to run inside VirtualBox or any virtual uh, virtualization software. If you didn't do that, it would be okay, but uh, that may uh, save a little bit of space. Then we install the server. And while that's getting started, I'll just minimize some of my windows and we'll focus on here. Uh, So we, I'll go through some of these steps very quickly. I'll just choose the, the options. Some of them will stop and explain. So the language we choose, the uh, country we're in, uh, the keyboard, let's choose a, just English standard keyboard. Now it's going to detect some hardware, which is presented by VirtualBox. And it's uh, checking the CD-ROM there and it should move on to the next step in a moment. Remembering that uh, what we need to do is we'll need to choose some options of where to install Ubuntu, on which disk, and in this case we have a single disk, that 2.5 gigabyte disk that we started uh, or we created when we created a new machine. So it's setting up the components uh, which uh, are important for the base operating system and then the other steps that we'll need to do and, and take care in is choosing a username and password, the, the login. Uh, we need to choose some software or, or some uh, different configurations and also get networking working. So there it was detecting network hardware. It, because we've chosen bridge mode it should uh, work correctly there and automatically get an IPv6 or an, an IPv4 address from my network, in this case the university network. So that proceeded okay. Here's my first option, choose a host name, choose a name for our computer. It defaults to Ubuntu but I'm just going to call mine for this demo. You can choose a more meaningful name. And now a username and you can give your full name there. Sorry, that was the, the full name of the, the, the user. Now, this is the username that you'll use for login. Uh, I'll leave mine as Stephen. You can choose another one. Choose a password. And note that when I type, it shows stars. Here, if I want to show, which I normally wouldn't do, I'm using student. Now, that's an insecure password. I've just chosen that for this demo you should generally think about choosing uh, stronger passwords for your uh, servers. And type it in again. It's a weak password. Yes, I'm okay with this because I'm not going to use this machine. I'm going to, after I create it in the demo, I'm going to delete it again. There's no need to encrypt our home directory. We're going to use this as a server. Uh, so no. It gets the time, it tries to work out what time zone I'm in and via the network and hopefully it will choose that I'm in Australia and in Queensland or the time zone pointing to Brisbane. Australia, Queensland, yes this is correct. Now it's going to detect what disks because soon I need to choose uh, where to install uh, Ubuntu. And this can be quite complicated how to partition disks and, and setting up those partitions to, to store all your file system. There are different options. Guided, use the entire disk. Remembering I've got a 2.5 gigabyte disk, so wipe out anything on that disk 
and install on top of that uh, Ubuntu. If you were installing Ubuntu on your laptop but not inside VirtualBox, you need to be careful here and make sure you don't overwrite Windows, for example. But here in VirtualBox, we're safe. There's nothing else installed. There are other options like using Logical Volume Management, LVM, and encryption, which will avoid at this, at this stage, we may discuss them in a later topic. So I'm going to use the entire disk. It's detected that there's a 2.7 gigabyte. Be careful of the rounding there. Disk, yes, select the disk to partition, and it will automatically determine a partitioning. And it's going to say, create two partitions on that disk, split it into two parts. One part is referred to as using the uh, format ext4, and that's going to be the main hard drive, probably about two gigabytes. And then the swap space is for virtual memory. We're going to keep the default and write the changes to disk. It may be useful taking a screenshot of uh, these settings so you can recall them at later stages. Write the change to disk so it sets up and now it uh, starts installing the system. So installing the software on those disks or on that disk in those partitions. Okay, it's asked, do we want to use a proxy? Generally, that will be no, we'll just continue. And now it's uh, may download some additional files to install. So, uh, and that may take probably the longest of, of all of these phases of installation. Uh, quite fast in this case, though, it's, it's gonna take a few seconds so we can sit and wait. Uh, so it may download software that we don't have in the uh, CD image, but I suspect most of it's already there. Okay, now it's asking, do I want to have automatic security updates? Uh, generally, you would uh, want to set up automatic security updates, but we may do that at a later stage. So for simplicity, I'm going to say no automatic updates. We can see how that can be done within the operating system uh, later. And now it's saying, do I want to install some additional software while I'm here? And again, we'll do that later. What I'll just do is choose the basic Ubuntu server and then continue. We'll show how to manually install things like the OpenSSH server, the LAMP server in a later stage. And it starts uh, retrieving those files either from uh, the included ISO or from the internet and installing the uh, packages. So it's installed those packages and now I've got to the stage where it's installed Grub. And Grub is the bootloader. So the, the operation of your computer is that the BIOS, when you, you boot the computer, the BIOS uh, runs first and then that loads some special software which will then load the operating system. And that special software is a bootloader and in Linux, it's commonly we use the Grub bootloader. This is important when you install multiple operating systems on the one computer. But here we're using VirtualBox and our one computer has just Ubuntu Linux on it. So we can choose the default option and yes, install on the master boot record. If you were installing direct on your laptop, you'd need to be careful there and think about the different options for installing Grub. And it's now finishing off the installation. So uh, setting the clock, probably remove some, some uh, software or, or files that are not necessary, do the final updates, and then we should be good to go. There we are, installation complete. It's time to boot your new system. So let's continue and give it a try. So it's called to reboot and that triggers uh, to shut down and boot up again. And it's, that was that screen that we saw for a couple of seconds was Grub choosing Ubuntu. It automatically chose it because there's only one operating system to choose. Now it's going through the boot process, 
giving us some output. And now we have our system up and running and we can log in. It notes that we've got Ubuntu 16.04.3. The name of the machine is Demo. It's asking us for a login username. Mine was Stephen and my password. In my case, student, you would have a secure one. Note that when you type your password, it's not shown, but it's being entered. And there I am, I'm logged in. Welcome to Ubuntu. The next thing we need to do is look at uh, updating the system, setting it up, and learning how to use the command line. The, before we do all that, we may shut down the machine, and you can do that via the, via the menu. We can cause a, call a shutdown, like pressing the power button on your computer, but we should do a software or graceful shutdown inside the operating system. And our first command we'll introduce you to is the shutdown or power off. Pseudo power off, ask for my password, and then it goes through the close down process and is powered off that machine. Now, the Ubuntu Linux server has been installed inside VirtualBox, set up and run. Let's explore a few options we have for managing our virtual machines within VirtualBox. So I have my Ubuntu Linux demo virtual machine, which is powered off. I actually have a couple of others. Kali Linux, which is powered off, uses 2 gig of RAM, and a Ubuntu desktop version, which is in a save state. Let's have a look at the, the states of difference between saved and powered off. So we start our machine and it will boot up. It takes a, a minute or so to boot up. Powered off means uh, we've, we've shut down the machine. Save means that it's like um, a suspending your computer or your, your laptop. So when you restart it, you start off from where you left off. You don't have to boot up again. So let's see that in action. So it's booting up uh, and then we will log in eventually. Okay, Stephen, password, I'm logged in to my machine. And if we want to shut down, we can uh, use the command line and use sudo power off or we can simply close here and it gives us three options. Power off machine is like pulling out the power cable. Now you may lose data in that case, so you generally don't want to do that. But if there's no other option, if the, the server has crashed, then maybe that's all you can do to shut it down. The preferred mode would be to send the shutdown signal, which uh, tells the operating system it's going to shut down. It's like uh, issuing a special command so that the operating system will gracefully shut down. That's the preferred mode. Whereas saving the machine state doesn't shut down, but saves the current state. So when we start it again, we start off with where we left off. So let's try that. It takes a bit of time to save, to, and it saves some extra information to disk. And now it's noted as saved. So if we start it again, we will not go through the full boot process. Instead, VirtualBox loads the state from disk, uh, restores the virtual machine, takes a few seconds, and we're back to, uh, sorry, we'll close that, we'll return back to that message. We're back to our where we were logged into the machine. So I recommend making use of saving the state rather than shutting down and rebooting all the time. What was that message that come up just then? If I actually, uh, you may see some messages which come up about the mouse, about the, um, the size of the window. We'll see other ways that we can increase the size of this window. We'll get a, a nicer GUI or, or a terminal at a later stage. So that's saving the machine state. Another thing we may want to do is from a particular machine is take a snapshot. So take a record at one particular point in time of how uh, the system is. So here we're logged in. Uh, we have some software 
it says some software can be updated. Uh, so a snapshot could be useful in saying, okay, let me record the state of the system now, then install some software. If something goes wrong, I can revert back to the previous state, that previous snapshot. So that's a good use for snapshots. To view and take snapshots, you can see from the menu, noting on different versions of VirtualBox, it may look differently, but there's usually an option to see snapshots. And currently there are none, it's just in the current state. If I right click and take a snapshot, I can choose it. Uh, and I give it a name. Initial log on, login. And it takes a snapshot. Okay. And now I do some things inside my machine. I run a few commands. Uh, I look at the history, which shows me I've run a few commands. I've run ls, echo, hello, and history. Okay. And Noting here, we have our current state and our initial login. In the current state, I've run three commands. The initial, initial login snapshot was before I ran those commands. So if I decide, well, I don't want to uh, have those commands run, what I can do is I can shut down. I can power off the machine, essentially deleting the current state and restoring back to the initial login snapshot. Let's try that. And to see that take effect, we'll start. And we'll see that those three commands that I ran uh, are no longer there. Let's hope so. It's restoring the machine. And it restores it to the initial uh, login state, we get a warning message here, and this is a message coming from the kernel upon boot. Maybe it's referring to the network adapter. This ENP0S3 is my uh, Ethernet adapter. It's gone through some reset, uh, possibly due to a, a network issue on my host computer. Are the commands there? What's my history of commands? That ls command and echo hello command are no longer there because we've reverted back to the initial login snapshot, losing the, the current state. So we can take snapshots, points in time, and you can take multiple for a particular machine. The other thing we may want to do is to, to copy the machine. And there's two approaches for doing it. So I'll just shut down and uh, yeah, we'll revert. So we've got our machine here and I want to take a copy of it. So if you look inside the directory where your machines are stored, in my case they're in my user directory and there's a folder called VirtualBox VMs. Inside there it's got folders for each of my three VMs. Ubuntu Linux demo, inside there is a VBox file and the disk image, this 2.5 gigabyte image, some log files, and records of the snapshots. Noting that taking a snapshot each time requires saving of some information, and that's in this, uh, these two files here. One way to copy the virtual machine is simply copy this whole directory. And that's useful for backups or copying and moving to another computer. Copy this directory using normal mechanisms and you can then open a copy of this virtual machine elsewhere, say on your home PC. But you generally don't want to copy the virtual machines if you want to run two on the same computer. That's called cloning. And VirtualBox has a way to do that. So we can copy the folders for backup purposes, but if you want to have a second machine based on the first one, we can clone. So inside VirtualBox, there's a clone option. And the new clone, call it dash two. Note it has an option to reinitialize the MAC addresses for network cards. So there are hardware addresses and 
uh, if I don't choose this option, the second machine will have exactly the same values as the first machine. Although it's not true in practice, in theory, MAC addresses should be unique across computers. And we may want to reinitialize re them, get new values. A full clone or a link clone, a full clone essentially will copy everything. Uh, a link clone will just copy and keep track of the differences from the old one. Uh, full clones are probably sufficient. Link clones are useful if you're uh, making many copies and you're keeping a, uh, a reference machine and having clones all link back to that single one. But we'll stay with a full clone here. Do we want to copy the uh, snapshots or just the current machine state? Let's just get the current machine state. And now it clones, it will clone the disk, right, a 2.5 gigabyte disk image, and that may take some time because essentially it's uh, copying and pasting that, that file. It says it's going to take 23 minutes, that seems excessive, but uh, there we go, much faster than that, uh, and it's cloned. Here we have Ubuntu Linux Demo 2 <coughs> and note in my folder I have this and if we looked at the details we should see that they're essentially the same machines. We'll boot this one up. And while that one's starting we can start this other one as well, the original. So here is demo 2 and this is the original and it's restoring. We have two virtual machines now, two different ones, essentially having the same setup. So that's useful if you want to build a base system uh, and then you want multiple servers, for example, multiple different servers which have um, are based upon that original system, you can clone the original system as many times as you need and we can run them in parallel. So that's some of the features, including saving machines, snapshots. For backups, you can simply copy the, the folder and for duplicating machines, we can clone them. Last thing we may want to do is, right, we've cloned, we've got this second clone here. We don't need it anymore, we can delete it. Well, that's quite easy. Uh, I'll just close that. Um, power it off, I'm not going to use it. And to delete, okay, remove the machine. Now this is important, there's delete all files or remove only. Uh, here removing only will leave some of the, the, the disk image and the uh, some log files possibly there. Generally if you no longer need it you can delete all files and that gets rid of everything and note that the folder disappeared here, so it's completely gone. If you don't delete all files and then you recreate one with the same name, there could be conflicts, so be careful. There are other tools available inside VirtualBox which you can explore, but that gives us some basic tools to, to manage our machines. We've got our Ubuntu Linux server running in VirtualBox. And so far we've been using the VirtualBox user interface to log in and issue commands. I'm going to show you how to use a, another uh, client software to log in to our server. And we're going to use PuTTY. Uh, we're going to use PuTTY as a secure shell client. And there's other se secure shell clients. And for that to work we need a secure shell server running on our demo Linux server. So first we'll install that. And the full command to install, I know the name of the server. I want to install the package called OpenSSHDAF server, uh, a, a common secure shell server on my Linux machine. We use the Ubuntu Package Manager app to install that, and we need administrator privileges to do that. So we proceed this command with sudo, and we are prompted for our password, we type it in. And then it goes away and checks which software packages are needed and asks me, do I want to continue? Yes, I do. Now it downloads those software packages and installs them. This is setting up a server 
on my Linux machine that allows clients to securely log in to my Linux machine. So it's up and running, and now I'm going to use PuTTY to act as the client. And it assumes you've got it installed. It's a free download. It brings up a window which asks me what's the host name or IP address that I want to connect to. And I can get that one way is using I have config on my server. What's the host name or IP address of my server? We see it's what the INET address is 138.77.176.57. So we'll type that in. The port number of 22 is, th is the default value which is used for the secure shell protocol, and we keep that. And the other settings should work uh, as default, so we'll try and log in. It's just bringing up windows here, we'll bring them across. First it gives me this security warning, saying, the client saying, I haven't, I don't really know if I can trust this server, something about the keys fingerprint, what we really should do is check that this indeed is the fingerprint of the server in case someone is performing some man in the middle attack. Well, I'm pretty sure they're not because the client is on my computer. The server is on my computer, but just inside VirtualBox, so I trust it. So I'm going to say, yes, I trust it now. I'm going to trust it in the future. And that brings up our PuTTY login interface. You can see very similar to the VirtualBox interface, a black terminal asks us to log in and enter the password and now I'm logged into the same Linux machine but using the PuTTY secure shell client and I can run commands just as I could via the VirtualBox interface. So not much difference at this stage except now we can do it from uh, other locations if needed. We can do that across a network not just locally on our computer. And even if we don't do that, uh, we'll find that PuTTY is much more configurable in terms of the user interface. We can change settings to make it look nicer. So I'll show how to do that with a few examples. If we right click on the top uh, menu bar, then we see some settings specific to PuTTY. Uh, I'm gonna change some of them. And it brings up a window where we can specify some settings. So for example, we can uh, change the appearance. I can change the font size. And the font style, consolas, let's make it 16 so it's a bit bigger. Uh, when we select for copy and paste, there are different modes in which we can do selection. And a common mode in, in Linux and in terminals is that, and referred as the X term mode here, is that I select with my left button and use middle button to paste. I'll show that in a moment. So I'm just going to change because by default PuTTY doesn't use this X term or Linux approach. It uses a compromise between Windows and Linux. I prefer this one because it's natural to Linux. You can change other things like color schemes, although it's not so easy. You need to change individual uh, uh, characteristics. You can uh, save settings to the default settings and change what's logged and a few other options that we may use. Let's try that and quite simply it's made my font slightly bigger so it's a bit easier to see. So that's much more powerful than what VirtualBox offers which is a simply fixed size font and, and uh, fixed colors. Regarding copy and paste if I type echo and I select that with my left mouse to paste, I simply middle click now. So you don't need to uh, do a, use the keyboard to copy and paste. You don't need to right click and bring up a menu. Just select, automatically copies, middle click, paste. change settings and save sessions so that uh, you can have different uh, settings depending upon the system you log into. So explore the PuTTY settings and create the configuration that uh, is best suits your needs.
there are different ways to transfer files from your uh, Linux server inside VirtualBox to your host computer, in this case my Windows laptop. Uh, I'm going to quickly show using FileZilla as a client to transfer files. This assumes you have OpenSSH server running on the Linux machine, which we've installed before for Putty's use. And we have FileZilla, the fr a free client. You can also do very similar using WinSCP. So this is FileZilla, and a, essentially a file transfer application. It's going to transfer files from my C drive, my Windows laptop, to the remote site. And I need to specify some address. Uh, or I can go through the site manager and set up a, a, a site and save the details for later. Let's do the quick approach at this stage. We need to know the IP address of our Linux server. 138 77 176 57 138 uh, we can copy and paste uh, 138 is the uh, and so on for the IP address username is that as a server password and port we use port 22 which is the default anyway uh, and this actually uses SFTP as a protocol for transferring files, which is a, a file transfer protocol built on top of Secure Shell. And we already have a Secure Shell server running on our machine. And let's connect. It does a connection. We see some status messages at the top. It's uh, successful. And it's listing the files here on the right hand side in my Linux machine. We note there's some hidden files starting with a dot here, which we don't normally see. Uh, but if I go back to my machine and I create a file using nano, for example, we won't use nano, it's not installed yet. We'll simply echo an example into a file. And if we do a refresh here, we see example.txt is shown up on the remote computer, and I can transfer that to my Windows laptop. And here's example.txt on my Windows laptop. Okay, so you can transfer files back and forth using FileZilla. WinSCP provides a different user interface, but essentially allows you to do the same one, the uh, same thing. Uh, choose the one that best uh, suits your needs there. We have our Linux server running in VirtualBox, and I'm going to log in in PuTTY. And my username and password. And I want to look at some information about my hardware and possibly my operating system. Uh, that information is uh, uh, stored in many different places in our system. We're going to use a, a few applications to, to get easy access to that information. Uh, but first, if we change into the root directory, we see there are a number of uh, subdirectories. Some of them that contain information about hardware is within the slash dev directory devices. Uh, so disks, um, uh, network devices, different hardware devices, uh, the operating system keeps track of them in the dev directory. Regarding software processes, historically that was stored in the, the, the proc directory, but in fact Linux stores a lot of information or gives the user access to a lot of information about the Linux kernel via this proc uh, directory. And it's trying to split that up and, and leave the pure process stuff there and put other system information in the sys directory. So the point there, there are three important directories in a Linux machine, dev, sys, and proc, which give the user access to information about the hardware and the operating system. So we can get it from there, but it's nicer to use some specialized applications to give us some information. One of them is LSHW, and we need to install that. So I'll install LSHW. It's not currently installed. It's LS for list, HW hardware. It provides us a, a very nice output which lists our hardware. And 
if I run LSHW, it shows me a long output of the hardware it detects. And I'll scroll up and we'll go through quickly some of those things. Noting that this uh, Linux machine is running inside VirtualBox, so there's no actual hardware, there's uh, virtual hardware, although some of it from my laptop is passed through. Some of the information may not be displayed because I didn't run it as super user, so if I proceeded the command with sudo, I may get a bit more, but not much. So it's showing that I have some memory, in this case about 500 megabytes. I set up with a 512 megabytes for RAM. The CPU, this is showing actually my uh, laptop CPU, the Intel i5, and some capabilities or features of the CPU. And then other hardware like the PCI bridge and, and PCI devices, most of them will be virtualized, provided by VirtualBox. The display, the virtual VGA display, which is not uh, uh, very important in this case, the virtual network device, an Intel LAN card. That's a virtual device. The actual device on my laptop is different, but VirtualBox presents it to Linux as this virtual Intel Ethernet card. And a number of other devices like audio, USB bridges, uh, storage devices, the SATA controller and the disk drives. And down the bottom the CD-ROM. So LSHW is one way to see some in information about our hardware. Uh, similar commands which show details about PCI and USB devices, that's LSPCI which gives a list of PCI devices and LSUSB is similar for USB devices which is not much in this case. On When Linux is running on real computers, on real hardware, this can be quite useful because you can identify the, the different devices, PCI, USB and other using LSHW, LSPCI and LSUSB. Uh, as with many commands there are in Linux there are many options. Uh, one of them, if you want more information, you want a verbose output, add the minus V option. And it gives details about those USB devices in this case. Many details of the USB devices. Similar with LSPCI. It gives details of all those PCI devices. So that's a little bit about the hardware. Uh, what about disks? Different ways to see disk space um, and the partitions and, and the structure of the, the file system. One is using DF. DF, uh, DF presents some summary information about the, the in this case, the uh, mounted uh, partitions. And it's a little bit complicated because there are some temporary file systems that Linux sets up. But the main one here is the root uh, directory, which is referring to the SDA1, which is a, a, a disk device. That's my main disk. And the output is a little bit easier if we show it in human-friendly form, the minus H option. And it shows my disk space here has uh, a total size of 2 gig, and I've used 1.1 gig. So that's a very useful information. Uh, the other temporary file system, the one we note here, this 245 meg, this is related to the swap drive which is used for virtual memory. So if you recall I set up my disk with 2.5 gig, Linux when it installed it allocated about 500 meg for um, virtual memory swap space and about 2 gig for the actual storage of files. Other information we can see about uh, the operating system, um, LSB release tells us something about the uh, Ubuntu version we're running. And we need the minus A option here to get anything useful. This tells us we're running Ubuntu 16.04.3 uh, long-term support, the version of Ubuntu we're running. And Ubuntu uses the Linux kernel. One way to see information about the version of the Linux kernel, uname-a, Linux, and the kernel version is 4.4.0-87 generic. And some other details about the, uh, that it's a 64-bit operating system. 
So there we have a few commands that will give us information about our computer, the hardware and the, the software and especially the operating system, LSHW, LSPCI, LSUSB for hardware, DF for disk space, LSB release and uname for the operating system information. Software is installed in Ubuntu Linux using a package management solution called apt. Uh, similar to an app store, uh, software is downloaded from a central server and installed with the, all the dependencies automatically managed, making it much simpler for the user. You can install software other ways, but it's very common to use a package manager. Uh, apt is the name. Uh, in fact, the, the command used is primarily apt-get, although recently, in the last couple of years, a sort of a, a, a higher level command called apt has been become more common, but you'll see in many instructions apt-get. Apt-get uh, has a number of options to see some of them. If you write apt-get help, you'll see the most used commands there. So to update, upgrade, install, to install packages, and so on. Apt is very similar, and in most cases, you can replace apt get with simply apt, and it also has a help. Many of the websites which give instructions will use the older apt get, but you can use the newer apt if you like. Again, it has the install command to install packages, remove, uh, Update is very common to update the list of packages on the system so your, your system is aware of what's available. Upgrade is to upgrade the existing ones and some uh, ways to list and, and to show details of current packages. So let's see it in use. We'll use apt for this example. First, let's install something. It's a common thing we want to do. We use apt install, we use an install command, and we need to know the name of the software that we want, the package specifically. One of them I know in a, is TCP dump. And apt install TCP dump says some error, cannot open lock file, permission denied is the key part there. Typically to install software, you need to be the administrator, you need to have pseudo privileges. And our user, uh, has sudo privileges, we can proceed the command with sudo and try again and ask my password for the first time. And what has it done? So it's worked this time. It's uh, looked and found that there is a package called TCP dump. It's found that it has a dependency called libpcap 0.8. So in order to install TCP dump, it must install the dependency and it will automatically do that for you. So it's going to install two packages here and it's given you some information about how much and do you want to continue? Yes, I want to continue. And it goes away and downloads those packages from a server. And we'll see where shortly and installs them. And that's done. So now TCP dump is installed along with all its dependencies. We can remove packages. Simply using the remove command, but note it was the following package was also automatically installed libpcap. It's only going to remove TCP dump. Let's say no to that. And let's try the other command. Auto remove. Here it recognizes that uh, TCP dump installed a dependency, libpcap. So with auto remove, it's going to re remove TCP dump and the dependency. And it does a check to make sure that dependency is not used by other software. So yes, we'll remove TCP dump. So we can install, remove, and auto remove. Another thing we do with regarding the existing software in the system is that we we'll often want to update it. New versions become available. And really, there's two steps that you should do to do that. First, you update the list of packages on your system. Using the update command. And that downloads from the server the list of packages so that it's got an up-to-date view and it knows of all the latest versions. 
and now we can upgrade with the upgrade command. And note it's recognized this whole list of packages that can be upgraded and will be upgraded if we choose yes to continue. And that's going to uh, use up another 164, 165 meg of disk space. So this is a common step to up, update your package list and then upgrade if you want to keep your software up to date. And just to save time, I'll say no, not to install them. Otherwise, it would have gone through the process of installing all of those packages and getting all the dependencies. It's good practice to do the update fo followed by the upgrade uh, on a regular basis, but be aware that doing upgrades of software needs some thought whether it's necessary to do the upgrade and whether it's going to have an impact on other um, uh, services. Going back to the help, we can list and search and show to find information about packages. For example, show information about packages we know about, TCP dump, and it shows something about that package. And if I scroll up, the package, the particular version, so the details about the maintainers, uh, the installed size, the dependencies, okay, so it requires these packages to work. They may be already installed, so it will check that for you. Uh, and some description of, of the package. So if you want to see more details of package, you can use show. You can list packages. List all the packages which start with TCP, for example, including TCP dump in that case. So to see the packages, not just installed, but the, you know, out of the entire set of packages, you, if you know the, the, the starting part of the name or no part of it, you can um, use app list. You can also use app search. And that will take longer because that search is not just through the names, but through the details, the, the package descriptions, for example, and, and gives us anything that mentions TCP in that case. The app is used for installing software, managing software packages. You may see instructions using apt-get, and almost in most cases you'll use that it's identical. You can replace apt-get with simply apt, and vice versa. So where do all these software packages come from? There's a server that your system uh, is pointed to, and it will download from there. So we can see some of those details. There's a configuration file. If we look in, if we use less to view the file, it's a text file, and I'll use the option line number so it's just a little bit easier to refer. And the file is in the etc directory, uh, apt, and sources.list is the name of the file. And this points to the server where you'll download the package information and the actual packages. So showing the line numbers along the left, noting that everything that starts with a hash character is a comment. Uh, so some of those things are commented out, but line nine contains some information saying uh, that the server giving the address au.archive.ubuntu.com slash Ubuntu is the location where the packages would be uh, downloaded from. And it refers to the version of Ubuntu you're using. And there's different repositories. Ubuntu has four different groupings uh, of all the packages. And it, this one's saying you can get the main and restricted uh, packages from this website. There may be some other options. For example, if you want to get updates to this version, uh, some may, you may, say may, may see lines like deb source if you want to be able to download the source code of those packages as well. So this server, what is it? What does it contain? Let's have a look. And in our web browser, go to Firefox and type in the address. 
Are you not? And in this case, it actually points to the Arnett mirror. So across the world, there are many different package servers. And normally when your system is installed, you could, it will choose a default one based upon the country, in this case in Australia, and this one's pointing to the Arnett mirror. You can change this by editing that sources.list file. Inside here, under the archives directory, is the all the package information and in particular under pool is where you'll find the actual packages and the four categories of packages are main multiverse restricted and universe and they're described by ubuntu the main are the main ones which canonical support canonical is the company that provides ubuntu uh, restricted if we saw in our sources.list main and restricted were listed Restricted contains uh, packages, again, usually can canonical uh, check, but they're proprietary. Uh, they may not be source code, but usually needed for drivers like Wi-Fi, uh, possibly some um, uh, codecs and so on. Universe is a community maintained software, which is not uh, supported by canonical, but may contain other software that's useful. And multiverse may be additional software, which may be questionable in terms of copyright or legal issues in different jurisdictions. If you go into here, you can see that they essentially have all the packages are grouped by letter. And when you run apt install, it will download the, the particular version from, from here. Uh, this one has no uh, GCC, we'd need to find one with the latest uh, version, and we should find, let's say, gconf editor. Let me find uh, the one we tried, TCP dump, and we'll talk about that. Okay, we've found the packages. The other ones may not be there because they may be linking to other names, so they may be the common names, but the actual name are, are, are different. I was unlucky. TCP dump, the packages are here, the different versions. Uh, for example, the, the .deb files are the packages and the different hardware, the AMD64, i386 versions. Uh, there's also the source, the .tar, .gz is the, the source, and some other configuration files for TCP dump. So back to our sources.list file. If you wanted to change this one way, you can change the server. You can find another server and you can edit the, uh, this sources.list file. But normally the default server is, is probably the best one or, or satisfactory. Let's have a very quick demonstration of Nano, the text editor. Uh, Nano is not by default installed on our server, so we need to install it first. And it's quite a simple, there's no dependencies, so we'll go down and uh, download that uh, nano package from the server and then install. And then we can use this text editor. So it's a very basic text editor. Uh, since it's not already installed, what could you use as an alternative? Vi or Vim is usually installed in a very basic form. Another more advanced, and, and it's significantly more advanced than Nano. Uh, Emacs is an, another alternative. Uh, but let's just go through Nano. It's quite a simple text editor where you can write uh, we can edit as in if you use Windows, say Notepad. Right, so a couple of the options. Uh, down the bottom is the menu. Okay, remember we have no mouse. So the menu uh, is, or at least it's key menu items are listed down the bottom where the hat character, uh, which in my keyboard is Shift 6, is, is this character, represents the control key. So Control G gets help. Control G gets help. 
and then you can read through and you the hat or the character character and you can read through and see all the different options not just listed in the menu but many other features that nano provides and to get out of the help control x so we're down the bottom exit control x and we're back to our text editor mode just a, a couple of options to copy and paste or to cut and paste really control k to cut <coughs> cuts the entire line, controlled U to uncut, and we can keep essentially pasting, and that's per line. Okay? There are some other options, but that's a, a quick way to copy and paste or cut and paste. Control K, Control U. To move your cursor to the end of the line, Control E to the end of the line, and back to the start, Control A. Of course, we can move up and down with our uh, keypad, but Control E to the end, Control A to the, the start of the line. And Control E, Control A are also available in other software, including Bash on the terminal when you're entering commands. Right, we want to save a file, so we actually write it to disk. So Control O in the menu writes the disk, writes the file to disk. So Control O will save. It will ask you the file name to write. That is, what name do we want to give the file? Example.txt. Uh, and I just press enter and it wrote six lines so it saves six lines to disk and if I want to exit control X because it's saved it's not going to prompt me it's immediately exits we can open that file again we can pass in the file name as a parameter and nano will open up that file and add another line and if we X exit without saving, control X, it asks us, do you want to save the modified buffer? Meaning that the file has been modified since the last time you saved it. If you say yes, we'll save it. If no, then you'll lose those changes. So we'll say Y for yes. And now it asks you, well, what do you want to name the file? And we don't want to change the name. We want to overwrite. So simply press enter because it's already example.txt. And now we exit. So that's a, a quick way to exit, is just to control X and it will prompt you if you need saving the file. Have a look at the different options with Nano, and in particular, the, the, all the different commands available which are explained in the help of, of Nano.